Thank you for joining us tonight for this webinar entitled Understanding Your Lab Results. Okay, so please note that after hearing the content in tonight's presentation, you are encouraged to follow up with your healthcare team to individualize this information for yourself. Please note that I do not have any relevant conflicts to disclose. So the learning objectives for today's talk are to review the basics of a lab report, to understand uh, the complete blood count, to understand your kidney function labs, and to, and to review other lab studies that your doctor might have ordered. So first of all, um, why should you bother to understand your lab results? Because many decisions that your healthcare provider makes are based on your lab tests such as uh, using them to establish a diagnosis, to monitor disease progression, to develop a course of action for any treatments that your provider may want to initiate, and then to monitor the response to therapy. So um, most of your lab tests are going to be uh, from blood. And so uh, the first thing I wanna talk about is, uh, so what is in your blood? Um, first, white cells that fight foreign bodies, red cells that carry oxygen, and plasma that contains uh, clotting factors. And um, this is uh, shown here on the right, a panel of your blood that has been spun, and um, serum, which is the, the clear part on the top that remains after the fibrinogen is removed and the blood clots, which is on the bottom. So this uh, part, the aqueous part on the top, contains dissolved proteins and hormones, minerals, carbon dioxide, and electrolytes, and all of that is measured. Okay, so here we have an example of a lab report, and all lab reports are gonna look a little different, but they also have some common features, and I've pointed those out here. So first will be the name and address of the lab where the test was performed, indicated by the number one here, the date and time that the report was printed, uh, the patient identifier, so who, the name of the patient or some other identifier, uh, the name of the physician shown here who's going to re receive the test results. Uh, the, the report will point out whether the request was STAT, meaning that the, the results should be reported right away or routine. The date and time the specimen was collected, the date it's reported, and then on a lab accession number, which is the number assigned to the specimen when it arrives in the lab. Then the source of the specimen will be listed. For example, tests can be performed on more than one sample type, such as plasma, serum, or urine. This one says whole blood. And then the name of the test and any abnormal results that fall outside the reference range. And for example, that's shown here. Here's a complete blood count, and you can see here as flagged that these uh, results are abnormal. So, the test will also list, uh, the report will also list if any of the results are critical. And what does that mean? Critical results are those, for example, shown here, that are dangerously abnormal. And these critical results must be reported to the responsible person, and the lab will, will usually make a note of that. So for example, here, with this hemoglobin of seven, this was reported to Dr. Smith at a per particular time. And that's to make sure that your provider is aware of these very important results. So next I wanna talk about what is meant by that reference range. So how do you know when the lab result is abnormal? Well, uh, that is uh, done by establishing uh, a, what is normal in a large population of quote healthy individuals. So there is usually not one normal value, but it's usually a range of normal values and those will be listed on your test results. Uh, I wanna point out that the medical data has to be interpreted in the context of the particular individual. So for example, and this is not a test result, but the average heart rate is said to be 70, but in a runner, for example, 55 may be fine. Um, it's also important to note that reference ranges may vary between laboratories depending on how they do the test. Reference ranges may also vary with age. For example, alkaline phosphatase, which is an enzyme made by bones, the 
is higher in kids, so the normal value will be different. Reference ranges may also vary by sex. For example, creatinine tends to be higher in males, and that's shown here to the right where you can see that the normal or reference value for serum creatinine in a male is higher than in a female. So what does it mean if your value is out of the reference range? Um, it could just be due to statistical variability. So for example, if you take the exact same sample and run it twice, 5% may just fall outside of the reference range by chance. There may be bi biological variability that is, is normal. For example, results can vary from day to day. And also, uh, as I pointed out before, there may not be a no one normal for everyone. There may be individual variability in what is normal. However, values out of the reference range may also be quite significant or indicate a problem that warrants further investigation by your healthcare provider. In some, these values have to be analyzed in the context of your symptoms and your physical exam, et cetera. Usually, the first course of action for an abnormal lab is to repeat it for the reasons listed above. Is it just uh, that it fell outside the normal range by chance? It could be that the sample wasn't collected properly. It may not have been refrigerated. Or as I showed you in that first slide where the blood is separated, it may not have been separated properly. So here, that's summarized here in this cartoon. Lab results have to be interpreted in context by your healthcare provider. And you can see this individual not looking too well. And the doctor who just looks at the normal value will say, good news, your test indicates that you're in the normal range. So again, all lab results have to be interpreted in context. So here, we're going to start out by learning about the basic or comprehensive metabolic panel which is what looks at the labs that are important for kidney function. And what I want to talk about first is the electrolyte panel. So before we get to the electrolytes, let's talk about the kidneys, because the kidneys are the primary factor that governs uh, those that electrolyte panel. So a couple of fast facts about the kidneys. We all have two kidneys, and those are shown here. They're in the back. And these kidneys are composed of each uh, have about 1 million nephrons each. And what does the nephron do? The nephron filters and processes the blood to form urine. It regulates not only the amount of fluid in the urine, but also the electrolytes. It all, the kidneys also filter waste products like creatinine. And you also need to appreciate that besides all of that, the kidney produces several hormones. And I've listed a few of those here, erythropoietin, We'll talk about that later, is very important for governing red cell production by the bone marrow. Renin, made in the kidney, regulates blood pressure. And finally, the kidneys are responsible for making sure that you have the right form of vitamin D, which ensures that calcium is absorbed in the diet. So what about these electrolytes? The ones that I showed you in the lab report include sodium, potassium, chloride, and bicarbonate. These electrolytes are affected by how much you take in. The concentration will be affected by the amount of water in your body, and then how much you excrete. The kidneys are typically critical in regulating this, but you can also lose electrolytes in sweat and stool. And then finally, aldosterone, which is a hormone that's produced by the adrenal gland, promotes uh, some of these, uh, how these electrolytes are excreted, for example, sodium and sodium reabsorption and potassium and acid excretion by the kidney. So let's talk about sodium, and that's very, very important, especially in the age of GINRQ. The reference range is somewhere on the order of 135 to 145, but as I told you, um, you know, reference ranges can vary. What is sodium? Salt. It's the major positive ion in the fluid outside of your cells. And why is it important? Because brain, muscle, and nervous system depend on electrical signals. And the movement of sodium is critical for making sure that these electrical signals are properly transmitted. Either too much or too little sodium can cause your cells to malfunction. And extremes in sodium levels, either too much or too little, can be fatal. 
So low sodium or hyponatremia means that you have excess water in relation to sodium. Okay, and that's shown in the panel all the way on the right over here. So what you can see is that the total amount of sodium may be the same. However, if you have too much water, the concentration of sodium goes down. And so what causes this? Excess water drinking and also diseases of the liver, such as cirrhosis and congestive heart failure, which cause you to drink too much water, thereby diluting the amount of sodium in your blood and tissues. What about high sodium or hypernatremia? This means, shown here, that you have excess sodium in relation to water, okay? So either you have too little water intake and you become dehydrated, or you may be losing too much water in relation to sodium in the urine. And this happens, for example, if you are on Tolvaptin or GinRQ because you are peeing out straight water, which is why your doctor will be monitoring the level of sodium sodium in your blood if you take this medication. Typically, excess sodium, um, such as that in the diet, is excreted uh, by the kidneys. So what about potassium? We all know that potassium is very important in the world of chronic kidney disease. The reference range is shown here. Potassium is the major positive ion inside cells. So sodium is outside cells, potassium is inside cells. And potassium is also involved in electrical signals. Potassium, as you know, is found in many foods. And to keep the level of potassium in your blood within this reference range is extremely important. About 90% of the potassium that you take in will be excreted by the kidney. And under normal conditions, the GI tract, uh, shown here, will excrete about 10%. And that's what I mean, normal conditions. If you develop diarrhea for some reason, the GI tract can excrete much more than that. Sweat is an even smaller amount under normal conditions, but if you're a marathon runner and you run a lot, uh, you will excrete even more. And again, aldosterone, that hormone made by the adrenal gland is very important in regulating the amount of potassium excretion by the kidney. So I just want to emphasize this. Why is the potassium level so important? Because the proper level is required for normal cell function. Most importantly, having the right level of potassium regulates your heartbeat, how your heart beats, and muscle function. Again, just like in the case of sodium, serious increases or decreases in potassium will increase the chance of an irregular heartbeat that can be fatal. And the kidney, again, is critical for excreting excess potassium. So if the kidney isn't working properly, uh, you're going you're gonna to have a problem with high levels of potassium. So what about these potassium levels? Um, if here are low and safe zones or anywhere under 5, between 5.1 and 6, you're in a caution zone and probably some action needs to be taken by your care provider. And higher than 6, you're in a danger zone and run the risk of having um, serious arrhythmias or irregular heartbeat. And the kind of EKG changes that we're looking at for are shown here. You know, where you completely, here's a very regular heartbeat, but you can see when the potassium level gets high, this just becomes completely disorganized. And as I said, um, it can be lethal. So uh, what about abnormal potassium levels? What caused them? You probably know some of this. Hyperkalemia means hyper, too much potassium, and kidney failure is going to be the main cause of this that's relevant um, in PKD. Um, if you have some degree of kidney dysfunction and you eat too much, such as in supplements or food, the levels can also be high. Um, you can develop high potassium levels if your acid levels are high, which also can happen uh, in kidney failure but also from tissue trauma. So for example, in a fall, if you're lying on the ground, you get muscle breakdown and all of the potassium inside cells will be released and can cause really dangerous levels of potassium. Um, not enough aldosterone. And then finally, there are certain drugs that can contribute to elevated levels of potassium. Those are uh, uh, drugs that we frequently use, such as ACE inhibitors, a common one being lisinopril, angiotensin receptor blockers, again, a common one being Losartan, and then certain diuretics were designed 
to make sure that the kidney doesn't excrete too much potassium and then drugs like Bactrim. What about hypokalemia or potassium levels being too low? That can happen in extremely poor oral intake or as I said, if you're losing too much from the GI tract, which can happen if you have excessive vomiting or diarrhea, if you use a lot of laxatives, some diuretics cause you to lose too much potassium and, and therefore levels have to be monitored. If you're a marathon runner, you have excessive sweating or excess aldosterone, all those things can lead to potassium levels that are too low. Other electrolytes I'm not gonna spend too much time on but are part of the panel. Chloride is that other uh, ion. Sodium chloride is what salt is, and chloride uh, goes along with sodium. It's the major negatively charged anion outside of cells with sodium. Just like sodium, it's excreted in the urine and sweat, and it pairs with sodium to make sure that electrical neutrality is met. And so it usually changes in the same direction as sodium and in the opposite direction as bicarbonate. We as physicians use the chloride levels in the electrolyte panel to help us diagnose electrolyte abnormalities. So what is bicarbonate or CO2? That reflects acid-base balance. So if your bicarbonate level is low, that means your acid level is high. So it's reciprocal and the pH is low. This is very important in kidney failure because when you have kidney failure, the kidney can't excrete acid properly and the bicarbonate level falls. There are a bunch of other conditions that can also cause this, including diabetes out of control, chronic diarrhea, poisoning with salicylate, and decreased aldosterone. Um, if your bicarbonate level is low, this can be replaced orally. High bicarbonate is, is the opposite it means that the acid level is low and the pH is high. And we see this usually in settings of extreme dehydration, such as might happen when you vomit a lot, you, uh, you become dehydrated for other reasons, such as sweating or increased aldosterone. So next um, part of the basic comprehensive metabolic panel that I want to talk about, which is very important and is kind of shown here, is the is kidney function. Okay, so um, what I want to talk about is how do we assess kidney function? So another uh, uh, value that's going to be on your lab report, you're going to see this here, is GFR. Okay. And that stands for glomerular filtration rate. So what is the GFR? Basically, it is telling you how well your kidneys are working, okay? So the kidney shown here, here's the blood flow, filters all of the blood in your body. And normally the kidneys will filter 180 liters of blood per day. Now you know you do not make 180 liters of urine. You only make about a liter or two. And that's because the kidney is responsible for reabsorbing 99% of all of this fluid back into the blood and then modifying the urine composition by either secreting certain things like potassium or reabsorbing other or other components. Okay, so how the kidney is filtering is the glomerular filtration rate. So how do we determine kidney function or glomerular filtration rate? In clinical practice, the plasma concentrations of waste substances such as creatinine and urea or BUN are used to estimate the kidney function. So that makes sense, right? These are waste products. If the kidney is working right, it gets rid of them, the levels are low. If the kidney isn't working right, these levels become elevated. So, okay. So what, measure, what measurements of kidney function do we use? One that you may be familiar with, with is BUN or blood urea nitrogen. And what is the blood urea nitrogen? It's a waste product. It's called urea, which is produced in the liver when the protein that you eat in your diet or protein from your tissues is broken down into amino acids. Urea made in the liver is released into your blood where it's filtered and excreted by the kidneys. Okay, so conditions that affect the kidney function and or the liver, because it's made in the liver, can affect the amount of urea in the blood. A high BUN implies impaired kidney function. 
However, it's not a great, greatly accurate measure of kidney function because BUN can be elevated for reasons other than kidney damage. Um, for example, any condition that results in decreased blood flow to the kidney, such as congestive heart failure, will elevate the BUN. Severe dehydration, GI bleeding, because you have red cells that are bleeding and get reabsorbed, so you have all this protein getting broken down. Anything that causes increased catabolism or protein breakdown will elevate the amount of urea. And some examples include increased protein in the diet or steroids such as prednisone, which cause increased tissue breakdown. I just wanna tell you that low BUN is not usually a cause for concern, although it can be seen in severe liver disease or malnutrition, but that's gonna be uncommon. So what about other more accurate measurements of kidney function? Creatinine is the most validated measure of kidney function that we have. The reference range, as I told you at the beginning of of this uh, webinar, the reference range is gonna vary between uh, males and females. So for example, for men, it's gonna be 0.7 to 1.3, a little bit lower for women. The idea is that creatinine is a normal muscle breakdown product. So anyone who's very muscular is going to make more creatinine so the levels can be higher. So muscular young adults, for example, may make more creatinine than elderly. So as I said, Creatinine is produced continuously from muscle breakdown. The kidneys filter creatinine from blood into the urine. And the amount of blood that is cleared of creatinine each minute is called the creatinine clearance. And it turns out that creatinine clearance by the kidney is a very good approximation of the glomerular filtration rate. So can we estimate the glomerular filtration rate from creatinine, and this is technically called eGFR or estimated GFR. The answer, yes, but I want to tell you a little bit about what's going on uh, because this is an evolving concept that you may have read about. There have been several equations developed over the years that estimate this GFR or kidney function from the creatinine that is measured in your blood, and this is done, these formulas adjust for age, sex, race, and body weight vary in varying combinations. So most labs currently use what we call the CKD-EPI equation, and I've written that down here, not for you to memorize in any way, but just to note that there's a correction for age, correction for being female, and up until recently, a correction for being African American or Black. The, this correction for race uh, and sex means that for any given creatinine measurement in your blood, the EGFR is going to be lower in women and higher in African Americans. So recently, the incorporation of race into this estimated GFR equation has been questioned because race, unlike age and sex, is, is essentially a social construct, especially in the US with all of the diversity um, that we have in our society. So new equations as of really the past month have been developed and published and validated that don't incorporate race. And the American Society of Nephrology and the National Kidney Foundation established a ta task force to make recommendations about the use of these equations in estimating glomerular filtration rate. And the papers uh, that uh, describe this are listed here if anybody's interested. Um, and they have recommended immediate impl implementation of new creatinine-based equations that do not uh, take race into account. And so you may be seeing this in your lab. They also determined that if you can incorporate another measure of cystatin C, um, the, these equations can be made more accurate. And so over the course of the next several years, I'm gonna predict that we will be incorporating cystatin C that will be measured in the blood sample into these estimating equations. So I just wanna show you the practical effect of this. So just because you can have one creatinine, but that can mean very different glomerular filtration rates. So for example, here, is a 20-year-old male, creatinine 1.2, using the newest uh, estimating equations that don't incorporate race, 
this individual's estimated GFR based on his sex and age is 89. Here we have a 56 year old male, exact same creatinine, but because creatinine uh, falls with age in everybody, the estimated GFR uh, is 71. So you can see there's a quite a big difference. How about a 56 year old female? Same age as the male, same creatinine, but the estimated GFR is far lower. And what about an 80 year old female? Same creatinine, but eGFR is even lower. So you can have the exact same creatinine, but, it, but very different uh, kidney function. And that can be estimated using these equations as we discussed. So I just wanna emphasize that these estimating equations, no matter how we modify them, have limitations. And that's why it is eGFR, estimated GFR, it's not precise. It can be inaccurate in patients with extremes in muscle mass or diet. So people who take supplements, people who are obese, or people who have had amputations. Creatinine must be stable for these equations to be, be accurate at all. There, it is known that they're not accurate in pregnancy, for example, and probably not accurate in acute illness or hospitalized patients where the creatinine isn't stable. It may be varying according to what's going on uh, in the patient's hospital course. And then finally, an acute kidney injury. So if you have any acute change, then these estimating equations will not be accurate. Uh, um, again, they're not as accurate in those with near normal kidney function. And in the future, equations that use cystatin C will be more accurate. So there are other methods for measuring GFR. So for example, maybe some of you have done 24-hour urine collections for creatinine. Usually there's a simultaneous blood creatinine measured and you can then calculate the creatinine clearance, which may be close to the estimated GFR, but not identical. So what are the limitations of this? First, it relies on accurate collections. So if you don't, if you miss a urine or maybe the jug isn't big enough, um, it may not be accurate. So sometimes people need to repeat these several times and that can be uh, burdensome, especially if you're trying to do this and you work. Uh, creatinine clearance measurements done on these 24-hour urines can overestimate the glomerular filtration rate at low GFRs. Um, and, um, but it, it's another measure and it can be useful when the estimated GFR is suspected to be inaccurate. So it's one more piece of data in assessing the kidney function. Inulin, iothalamate, or iohexol clearances are the gold standard. They're very accurate measures of the glomerular filtration rate, but they are four to five hour tests, cannot practically be used in clinical care, but they are used uh, oftentimes in research protocols. So I just want to remind you of the different stages of chronic kidney disease that can be based on these estimated GFR measurements. So stage one means that you may have an abnormal kidney, but your function will be normal, so that GFR will be 90 or higher. So very normal kidney function, but maybe some structural damage. Stage two means that your GFR is between 60 and 89, and that means there is some mild loss of function. Stage 3A is between 45 and 59. Stage 3B between 30 and 44. Stage 4 is when your GFR is under 30, between 15 and 29. And stage 5 means that you are in kidney failure. So those estimated GFR measurements will be, can be interpreted in, in the context of this rubric, which uh, is available online. So now I wanna move on to the complete blood count or CBC. This is just showing an example of a complete blood count and what, what is reported. So the complete blood count evaluates three cell types that circulate in the blood and that's shown schematically here in this picture. White cells are in the blood, I'm indicating a few white cells. Red cells shown here and then platelets shown here. And the CBC, or complete blood count, really screens for a wide variety of conditions, including infection, anemia, inflammation, and bleeding disorders. So first, 
let's talk about white cells which circulate in your blood. They're all different kinds of white cells in the blood, and those are shown here. And what do the white cells in your blood do? They fight infection. So if you are exposed to an infection, infectious agent, your white cells may go up. So your doctor may be looking for high neutrophil count. Um, usually what we do when we get a white count is we get a differential. And that was shown on that, um, that example. So what does the differential do? But it, it classifies all the different kinds of white cells in your blood. So it will look at the neutrophils, at lymphocytes, shown here, at monocytes. And each type of white cell, as I alluded to, plays a different role in the body. And the numbers may give information about the immune system and what it's reacting to. So for example, this cell here, the eosinophil, will be high in an allergic reaction, for example. What about red cells? Red cells are the most common type of cell in the blood. Um, and here's the reference range. Red cells carry oxygen from the lungs to the tissues and conversely carbon dioxide or waste product from the bodies to the lungs so you can get rid of it and breathe it out. The hemoglobin. The hemoglobin, here's the normal reference range, is the protein in these red cells that's actually carrying the oxygen. And then hematocrit is the packed cell volume. So if you spin down all the red cells, what percentage of the blood is, is in this packed cell volume? The reference range will be somewhere between 36 and 50%. So in terms of anal analyzing whether you're anemic or not, the hemoglobin and the hematocrit, these two, not this one so much, are the best measures of anemia. Uh, other uh, reported indices include uh, the mean corpuscular volume, which tells you the size of the red cells, how much hemoglobin on average is in re each red cell is also reported, but not that useful. Sometimes we look at the MCV, it can be very small, red cells can be very small if you're iron deficient and very large um, if you're B12 or folate deficient. And then platelets finally. Platelets are required for clotting, and if you have too few, you may be predisposed to bleeding, and if you have too many, you may be predisposed to clotting. So what are the causes of increased white cells? I pretty much already told you, it can be, they can be increased in any type of infection, whether it be bacterial or viral. They can also be increased in the setting of any type of nonspecific inflammation, in leukemia, and if you're under severe stress, or if you've gotten steroids. So frequently, if people are being treated for asthma with steroids, they will have an increased white count. What about decrease in white cells? Any type of bone marrow disorder or damage, autoimmune um, diseases such as lupus um, can cause a decrease in white cells. It's usually autoimmune, your body develops uh, antibodies towards these white cells and they decline. Sepsis, overwhelming infection, not just uh, a, a, an infe a mild infection, can cause a decreased white count just because of complete bone marrow suppression. And then again, cancer that spreads to the bone marrow. What about platelets? Platelets, again, there are a variety of um, uh, conditions that lead to increased platelets, including malignancy, iron deficiency, inflammation, and then bone marrow disorders. And decrease, again, severe infections, viral, autoimmune, um, cirrhosis and liver disease, sepsis, overwhelming infection, leukemia, and chemotherapy. So what about anemia? Um, so this is common in chronic kidney disease. Anemia, um, there are many causes, acute or chronic bleeding of any kind. So if you have an ulcer and you're losing blood, that can make you anemic. Nutritional deficiency. So if you don't have enough iron in your diet enough or enough B12 or folate, there are also inherited causes of anemia. Ones that you might be familiar with include sickle cell disorder and thalassemia bone marrow disorders, and anything that causes chronic inflammation can suppress the bone marrow so that you don't make as many red cells. Um, any kind of chronic kidney disease, uh, a chronic disease and kidney failure would fall in that category. And then, of course, drugs such as chemotherapy that you might get for something else. Just like you can have uh, 
a low, a, be anemic, you can also have too many red cells. And that's called polycythemia. Again, that happens if you become very dehydrated, you just get concentrated, um, or there are bone marrow disorders. And what that looks like is shown schematically here. So this is just, if you spin down the blood, this is the normal um, hematocrit or this, the, the amount of of uh, the blood that's taken up by this the red blood cells. If you're anemic, it will be depressed, and if you have too much, it's going to get too high. So let's talk about ane uh, anemia in kidney disease because this is important. Um, so as I said before, a low hemoglobin or hematocrit means that you are anemic. And why is this important? because the red blood cells carry oxygen to the tissue. So if your tissues don't have enough oxygen, you might feel fatigued or short of breath. So anemia, as I said, is common in kidney disease, and it can occur early um, when you may have up to 20 to 50% of kidney function remaining. And so why do we, why do we see anemia in kidney disease? It's because kidneys uh, make a hormone that I mentioned first off, which is called erythropoietin, okay? And erythropoietin made by the kidney acts on your bone marrow and stimulates it to make red blood cells. So if, you have, if your kidneys are diseased or there's not enough normal kidney uh, tissue remaining, then you don't make enough erythropoietin. And this is quite common in kidney disease. So how do we treat that? Some of you may may be aware of this, but we can give recombinant erythropoietin subcutaneously, even before you're on dialysis, to try to uh, to try to stimulate the bone marrow to make more red cells. Usually, we don't use this unless the hemoglobin is less than 10, and that is kind of mandated by uh, insurance largely. Um, also, um, EPO does not work right if your iron levels are not. Uh, within range, so you may also need iron to go along with the erythropoietin. We target a hemoglobin more than 10, 10 to 12. We don't want it too high because that causes clotting and, and is, it can become a problem. There is a new class of drugs that have been in clinical trials. You may have heard about them to treat um, anemia and kidney disease. They're called HIF stabilizers, and what they do is stabilize. Um, a HIF, which is a factor that promotes epigen uh, production. The one that has recently been in the news is called Roxadustat, um, and an, uh, unfortunately an FDA advisory panel over the summer voted against approval for this um, because there were uh, there was an increased incidence of cardiovascular events or clotting, and it, there, it's possible that the the, le the uh, dose that was used in the study is too high, so I think it remains to be seen uh, what they're going to, how, the, how they're going to move forward with this. Finally, um, this is important uh, for kidneys. What about the urinalysis? Here is an example of a urinalysis, uh, what, what it looks like, the result. Um, so uh, the first part of the urinalysis is, is just giving uh, the color, the appearance, and some of this um, uh, is done by a dipstick, and you can you can see that here. So you'll see uh, whether there's protein in the urine, whether there's sugar in the urine, whether there are ketones in the urine, and occult blood. And then the second part of the urinalysis is the microscopic exam, where where the urine is looked at under a microscope to see what kind of cells there are. So it should be clear, there should be no cells, um, but you can hear this is an example of a urine sample with a lot of white cells, and you might see this in an infection, for example. Um, casts are another type of, um, they're, they're cell aggregates that can be a sign of kidney disease, uh, as an example. Okay, so what we don't want to see in the urine is protein, okay, and that's usually, you can see that on a dipstick, um, and protein in the urine, or what we also refer to as proteinuria, may be the first sign of kidney disease. It can be measured on that dipstick that I showed you on the last slide. Um, let me just show it to you again over here, the dipstick. Or you can measure um, the albumin in the urine. Okay, so this is showing you that the glomerulus again, that filtering unit of the kidney. And so um, what you can see here, these green dots are meant to be protein. 
and these should not be filtered into the urine. This, the, 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 um, the capillary, the structure of this should be sufficient to keep protein in the blood and not in the urine. So if it starts to leak out, that means that there is a problem in the kidney. Okay, so we can measure the albumin in the urine, compare it to the amount of creatinine, and here are the normal ranges. Sometimes we collect a 24-hour urine, which can be more precise to look at the amount of protein in the urine. And if you have more than three grams of protein in, in a 24-hour in urine collection, that's considered to be, quote, nephrotic range proteinuria. So what's important in terms of ADPKD is that it is not usually associated with nephrotic range proteinuria. So if you do have this level of uh, protein in your urine, it usually means that there's a, a second problem that needs to be investigated. So getting back to the last part of this basic or comprehensive metabolic panel, I want to talk about calcium and phosphorus. And these are measures of bone health. And why are we talking about bone health in the setting of kidney disease? Well, when the kidney isn't working, and I'm talking about stage three to five chronic kidney disease, you tend to accumulate phosphate in the blood because the kidney does not filter it properly. So in addition, as I mentioned in the very first part of my talk, uh, the kidney is critical for making the active form of vitamin D, and that's shown here. Okay, so when you have phosphate that's too high in your blood and you don't have enough vitamin D, this results in a lower calcium level. This calcium, low calcium level shown here, then signals to your parathyroid gland, oh, my calcium level is low, I need to normalize that. That causes the parathyroid gland to make more parathyroid hormone, which then causes bone resorption and can cause bone disease. So as you develop chronic kidney disease, your doctor may check this PTH level, we call it intact PTH, to make sure that it isn't getting too high. And if it is, sometimes you can be treated with that active form of vitamin T, D, which is called calcitriol. Finally, the last part of the complete metabolic panel is liver function tests. And those here, this hepatic function panel, it's shown here what we're looking for. And the purpose of this is to monitor liver disease or function. These enzymes here called AST and ALT are enzymes found inside of liver cells. You should have no, low levels in the blood. However, if you have liver damage, for example, due to hepatitis or drugs like GenRQ, the liver cells break open and release these enzymes into the blood and are detected, okay? And that's a sign of liver damage. Alkaline phosphatase is another liver, a type of liver enzyme which is produced by the bile ducts and rises when the bile ducts are blocked. Um, there are two types of alkaline phosphatase, however. There's another type that's made, made by bone and intestine. So, so you, you can differentiate by doing another blood test. And then finally, bilirubin, shown here. There's total and direct. Bilirubin is a breakdown product of red blood cells, and the, the, this bilirubin is modified in the liver and then secreted in the bile and urine. And elevated levels of bilirubin are what cause you to be jaundiced. And then finally, albumin is also, which we talked about before, which is the main protein circulating in your blood. Uh, it's part of the liver function panel because it's made by the liver, binds to hormones, and as I said before, should not be excreted in the urine. So the last test I want to talk about is the fasting lipid profile. Okay, so usually you should fast between 9 and 12 hours to before you get your cholesterol, your total lipid panel checked. Okay, and so the um, this is what is reported in the lipid panel. In addition to total cholesterol and triglycerides, which are the two types of fats that are transported in your blood, we also me measure different uh, uh, particles in the blood that contain both fats and proteins. And um, the total cholesterol measures all types of cholesterol in these particles. The HDL is what's called the good cholesterol because it takes the excess cholesterol in your body to the liver for removal. So we want to get rid of excess cholesterol, so HDL is good. LDL, or bad cholesterol, deposits um, 
uh, cholesterol in your blood vessels, and that's bad because that's what's responsible for heart disease. So uh, your doctor may check your lipid profile because it's part of a cardiac risk assessment or your risk for heart disease. And if you have kidney disease or high blood pressure, you already have two risk factors. So it's very important to make sure that uh, you don't add another one in the form of a uh, very high cholesterol. So the treatment of high cholesterol is going to depend on your total number of risk factors. And treatments may include diet, exercise, and medication. So I'm going to end here. Um, thank you so much for joining us uh, for this webinar. Thank you very much.